Hey, everybody. He's Austin Powers. He's Dr. Evil. I'm number two. She's Vanessa Kensington. No, wait. That ain't it. We are not, definitely not, international men of mystery. But we are Vikings Report with Drew, Chris, and Ted. How are you? Hello again, everybody. Robert W. Fosworth here. This week, our undefeated Minnesota Vikings traverse the Atlantic Ocean on the Queen Elizabeth II to face Robert Salah, Aaron Rodgers, and the dastardly New York Jets. Will they come home from the island undefeated, or will they lose to the green gangrene? We'll find out. All right. Thanks, Robert. Barnsworth's been into the Bushmills already. That's that's uh... yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Lager and lime, man. That's that's a direct choice over there. <laughs> oh man, we only played the Jets twelve times in our history. Yeah, that's I, one of the teams we played the least amount. Well, other than like the expansion teams, like Houston and all the that. Texans. And... After we beat them in that seventy-five game that we talked about earlier, the Vikings mm-hmm. didn't beat them for like forty years. I know they lost like eight in a row. But they've won the last few, so we're, mm-hmm. we're getting back close to even here, I think. Yeah, the Minnesota Vikings are on their way to Tottenham Hotspur Stadium to play the New York Jets in uh, jolly old England, 8.30. God's time or central time Sunday morning. My grandson said he wants to spend the night Saturday, should get up early and watch the game with me, which is kind of cool. Wow, that's <laughs> really cool. Yeah. So, as always, we're going to put the big board up. As our tribute to the uh, the old CBS Today pregame show with uh, Brent Musburger, Jimmy the Greek Snyder, Phyllis George, Mimi Rogers, or Phyllis George, Phyllis George. Ooh, that's a that's a close one. Uh, I'll, I'll go I'll go with Phyllis as well. Oh, okay. Phyllis George, Mimi Rogers, or Jane Kennedy. Ooh. Oh. <laughs> oh, Phyllis George. Still going, with Phyllis George. <laughs> Shag, baby, yeah. <laughs> shag now or shag later? Felicity <laughs> shag very well, baby. <laughs> uh, Gene uh, Kennedy, though, close second. All right, so, all right, this week we'll start with Chris, then we'll go with Drew, and then I'll go. So we'll start with quarterback. We'll go down the line, as you can see. So Chris started off with quarterback. You got Aaron Rodgers versus uh, the Honest to God, and we're not kidding, and nobody would have thought this four games into the season, but kind of the odds-on favorite for MVP is Sam Darnold. So, Chris? MVP, comeback player of the year, governor of Minnesota. <laughs> what, whatever the guy wants to do at this point, we'll hire him. International man of mystery, isn't he, at this point? He kind of is. I sure. mean, I broke out last week and actually went with Sam Darnold over uh, whatever warm body the Packers were going to put out there. Quarterback really didn't matter. And uh, we've already talked about Aaron Rodgers a little bit. He's not what he was. He's not even close. He's not an upper echelon quarterback anymore, as much as the uh, announcers for this one are probably going to try to make him out to be one. I'm not looking forward to that. That's about the only aspect of this one I'm not looking forward to. But yeah, Sam Darnold, the only quarterback in the National Football League through four weeks who's in double digits in touchdown passes. The next closest guy, I think, has eight. So he's well ahead of the field. And yeah, nobody saw this coming, and as long as uh, Kevin O'Connell is uh, coaching him up and calling plays, he's going to keep it going. So uh, check mark to uh, Sling and Sammy on this one. Drew? I'm going with Sam Darnold because he's going one direction and Mimi Rogers is going the other. Uh, that game <laughs> against Denver, Aaron Rodgers, 24 of 42, 225, no touchdowns, and he got sacked five times. He's got Hardly any weapons to work with. He's got Garrett Wilson. And that's it. Um, (laughs) He's got the worst (laughs) pass protecting left guard. Maybe the worst left guard in all of football with John Simpson. He can't pass protect. The Vikings are going to eat him alive. Watch. You watch. They're going to have a problem at left guard. The whole left side of the offensive line, they're going to have major problems with. Simpson can't block. Pass pro. You got to go with Darnold uh, on this one. And it's kind of weird picking Sam Darnold over Aaron Rodgers. The times have changed. If you would have saw the schedule in August and said Sam Darnold versus Aaron Rodgers and said with a clear mind, I'm going to pick Sam Darnold as the best quarterback in this game, 
people would have called you either an insane homer or just dropped the word homer and called you insane. It's true. It's accurate. Aaron Rodgers, I'm not going to say has dropped off a cliff, but he's not the guy he was three years ago, four years ago, five years ago. I mean, he and he's, he's tormented the Vikings for years, but that's when he had guys like Devontae Adams to throw to. But he he's had great players to throw the football to, and he's had great offensive lines protecting him, and he had good offensive-minded coaches in Mike McCarthy calling plays, getting him deep in the playoffs for many years. And he doesn't have that in New York. Plus, he's coming off an Achilles tear, and now he's got a knee issue. He's not nearly as mobile. The one thing the one thing Aaron Rodgers used to kill the Vikings on is that if he got pressured, he could move out of the pocket or or move in the pocket to give himself some time to allow a guy like Alan Lazard, who's not the guy like he used to be either when he was in Green Bay, to get open and make a play. He doesn't have that, that mobility anymore either, I don't think. I mean, he's, what, 40 now, isn't he 41? I'm going with Darnold here, but I will say this. If there's a guy that can figure out a Brian Flores defense, it's a guy with the experience of Aaron Rodgers. He's got the mental capacity to see what might be coming. I don't know if he has the physical ability to be able to react enough in time to counter it, if that makes sense. Yeah, but KOC's always had a good game plan for Rodgers, even when Rodgers was doing really well with, with the Packers. We'll have to see what kind of plan they have for him. All right, Drew, tell us about the running game. You know, I think part of the reason that Rodgers is struggling a little bit this year is he hasn't gotten out of his running game what he thought or anybody else thought at this point. That Brees Hall has been a huge disappointment. Did you see his, his stat line last week, Ted? That's bad. I know they're 27th overall running the ball in the NFL, which with Brees Hall, that's stunning. He had 10 rushes for four yards. God. Jeez. That's bad. That, I mean, I no. think that uh, Braylon Allen guy ended might end up taking his job because he's the guy that's actually been coming on for him in the run game. And he's not hurt. No, the run game's been a huge disappointment for New York, and they expected that to be a huge part of the offense to help Rodgers. They have Brees Hall, 3.1 yard average, only 174 yards on the season. He averages 43 yards a game, which is not good. This is a little tidbit that I'll point out. In 56 carries this year, Brees Hall has one run of over 20 yards, which wow. is not good. Wow. If you're looking at the big stats, so Brees Hall has been more like Ar Arsenio Hall at this point. So <laughs> Arsenio Hall, <laughs> I'm going to have to give the Vikings the tea and crumpet edge with the run game. Uh, they've been very good against the run, Minnesota. So I don't know what Brees Hall's problem is, but if they keep playing like they do, they're not even going to be close to getting any yards on the ground. So I think Minnesota has a big advantage run game. Yeah, I do too. Aaron Jones, I don't think he's broken the 100-yard mark yet this year, but he's been very consistent in running the ball. He's only had that one fumble, and that was off a screen pass to their goal line in, in the San Francisco game. He keeps the Vikings ahead of the down-and-distance situation. That He keeps them advantage offense, if you will, is second and short. The Vikings have, have had very few negative plays running the ball this year, which is good. You add in the dimension of Ty Chandler that he brings. They talked about putting Aaron Jones on a pitch count in terms of running the ball, and they've really had no drop-off with Chandler when he comes in and runs the ball for the most part. I really like the Vikings running game so far this year. Vikings as well. No, I absolutely agree. I mean, Aaron Jones has been outstanding. He did have a 100-yard game against uh, Houston. He had oh, my 102, bad. And okay. uh, he went over 90 against both uh, Green Bay and uh, the Giants. Only real low yardage game he's had so far is San Francisco. But between Jones and Chandler and the blocking we've seen up front for the Vikings and Kevin O'Connell's ability to mix up play calls and whatnot, yeah, I, I think he's been fine. And the running game for the Vikings has been significantly better uh, than what we've seen for Jets so far. I didn't even think the Vikings had 100 yards total running the ball through, through four games last year with Madison. God, they were terrible running the ball last That's year. Huge, huge, improve, huge shot in the arm for the run game this year. Yeah. Receiving game, I'll start this off. Drew, you mentioned Garrett Wilson. Uh, just off the top of the head, Drew, uh, what school did Garrett Wilson go to? Ted. I'll give you a hint. Starts with Ohio State. That's where he went. That's right. He was great at Ohio State. <laughs> but, yeah. And, like, I don't get it. Like, the last couple of years when Rodgers was in Green Bay, their receiving core really kind of wasn't all that great. And when he came to the Jets, he wanted guys like Alan Lazard 
there was another dude. Do you remember off the top of your head, Chris? Randall Cobb was there for a while. Randall Cobb, that's it, yeah. And he wanted Randall Cobb to come to the Jets. But Tyler Conklin is their tight end who used to play for the Vikings. He's a fairly decent tight end for them. But when you look over at the other side, uh, on the Vikings side, you've got Jefferson, obviously. Jordan Addison came back last week, had two touchdowns. Jalen Naylor, who's arguably probably the best third wide receiver in the NFL right now. We all said if he could just stay healthy, he'd be a a hell of a contributor to this football team, and it's turned out he's picked up that tight end production that TJ Hawkinson couldn't provide since he's been out. Vikings, hands down. Absolutely. I mean, you talked about Garrett Wilson. Garrett Wilson is one of the best wide receivers in the league, but you know, player for player, the Jets just don't stack up to the Vikings as far as their receiving options. You know, we talked about Addison. He came back in a huge way last week not just in the uh, the pass game, but in the run game even, with that rushing touchdown he had. But the one thing I'm looking forward to as far as uh, the Vikings in the pass game is that uh, I think Sauce Gardner is going to be following uh, Justin Jefferson around basically all day. So I don't know if he's going to have quite the uh, the contribution, but I think the, the rest of the Vikings receiving core at this point has more than shown that they can pick up the rest of the slack if he gets locked up a little bit. So I don't think Sauce Gardner is going to lock him up completely. I think he's still going to get his, but, uh, you know, Gardner is probably the best cornerback in the league. So it's going to be interesting to see that matchup. But yeah, Vikings hands down for this one. All right, Chris, talk to us about the uh, do offensive line. Do I not get line. to do the receivers? You did. You, you did. You started off with receivers, didn't you? No. Uh, you did it, and then. No. No. You started off with receivers? No. I'm sorry. My bad. Go ahead. That's all right. And I can see why you want right. to shut me down because I was going to start out by saying, <laughs> didn't they have, didn't Ohio State have Garrett Wilson, yeah. Marvin Harrison Jr.? No, be quiet. Garrett Wilson, huh? Marvin Harrison Jr., and Smith and Jigba at the same time? They did. And they couldn't beat Michigan. Let this be a reminder to you all that this organization will not tolerate failure. Uh-huh. <laughs> Shut up, man! In Japan, the men come first and the women come second. Or sometimes not at all, <laughs> baby! I got uh, I got a quick quick thing. I'm going to start out with my receiver thing. It's going to be fast and quick because the Vikings got are going to get the check mark. But to what Chris said, when you look at the secondaries, that stuff factors in. They got Sauce Gardner, great corner. I think he might be a little overrated, but that's another topic for another show. They don't have anything else in their secondary. They're going to have a hell of a t- factor in the secondary as you give the check mark right off the bat. But if you look at the big three wide receivers, the Jets, Wilson, Lazard, Williams, 44 catches, one touchdown. Vikings big three, J.J., Addison, and Naylor, with Addison missing two games, 34 catches, eight touchdowns big difference on the big plays the scoring plays their wide receivers have one touchdown all season so you factor in that and the uh, secondary it's an easy check mark for the vikings thank you for allowing me to talk about the receivers sorry about that man it's all right my bad all right we'll let chris talk about the offensive line first i've completely i've completely gone off the rails talk about the o-line chris so the offensive line i mean we've seen it uh week in and week out from the vikings i mean sam darnold i believe he was hit uh once the entire game against Green Bay. And, you know, we've talked about all year, the first four games of the season, the Vikings have seen elite pass rushing duos against the Giants, against Houston, against the Niners. Green Bay wasn't quite on that level. But, uh, you know, Darnold's uh, been allowed to stay upright, and they're opening up holes in the running game for uh, for Aaron Jones and company. And, you know, the Jets, uh, I think they've lost a couple of guys to injuries. So uh, I, I believe they're starting a rookie at left tackle, are they not? I think they right I think tackle. they are kind of, oh right tackle they're starting a rookie at right tackle yeah that's who it was because yeah, uh, Morgan Moses went out no yeah, it's another pretty clear advantage for the Vikings here Drew Ted this is even more an advantage than the receiving game the Jets O line is a mess their interior offensive line is trash and it's garbage and it stinks the piss poor pass protection. You got Fashano over there on the right, probably going to have to deal with Turner, right? They have pretty good tackles, but the interior is poor. The Vikings should make a bloodbath with the front seven against the, especially the interior of the Jets offensive line. 
I don't know what they're going to do. I see them as having as much of an advantage position-wise, Ted, that we've ever had on Vikings Report this week between the line of scrimmage. I watched some highlights of that Broncos game, and Aaron Rodgers was kind of under assault. There were no lanes to run the ball. He had very little time to, to set up and pass. I mean, they're going to have to do quick three-step drop type stuff. When you see what the Vikings can do and how they set up pre-snap with Van Ginkle and Cashman and Grenard, how they all crowd the line, and then some guys rush, some guys back out into the flat and take that kind of stuff away. If that's not open, now somebody's going to be on Rodgers, and he just doesn't have that mobility he had even three or four years ago. You're right, the Jets are, are injured and a, and a mess, and how the playing surface is, who knows? The clear advantage here is to Minnesota as well. I agree. All right, Drew, you go first for the front seven. The Vikings run a 3-4, the Jets run a base 4-3. You know, when I started researching this front seven, guys, it seemed pretty easy because I saw on the Jets roster they have Chaz Surratt as a linebacker, and they also have the great legend that he is, Jalen Holmes, the old Viking guy. Remember how great he was for the Vikings, old Jalen Holmes and Chaz Surratt. I was tempted to just give them the check mark right off the bat. I mean, with those two guys, Ted, those are disruptive game changers. It doesn't get much. He's like the second coming of Kylie Wong. That legendary 2021 third round, fourth <laughs> third round pick class of Rick Spielman. I, be- <laughs> I mentioned earlier they have five good players. One of them is Quinn and Williams. I will say that that guy, you know, the Vikings have been at Dexter Lawrence and they had uh, Kenny Clark. They've had to face some tough guys inside. Williams, besides Lawrence, might be better, and he might be second to Lawrence. So if you allow him to get disruptive in the middle, he can cause you some problems. The Jets only have 10 sacks on the season. So I imagine the Vikings, if they can handle Quinn and Williams, it should be another huge avalanche for advantage with the Vikings. on the. They should control the line of scrimmage of both sides of the football, and if they don't, they would be a real man of mystery. It would be tough. For me to see, but Vikings get my check mark with the front seven, not even close. Chris, the Jets have a guy in their front seven in Hassan Reddick who has decided he would rather eat eight hundred thousand dollars in <laughs> fines every week <laughs> than play football for the New York Jets. Uh, that kind of sums up the state of the Jets right now. To be honest, I mean, if they had a guy of Reddick's caliber, it might be a little closer. But you know, like Drew said, basically their front seven at this point is Quinn and Williams and nothing else and we've seen it from the vikings all year i mean dallas turner was limited last week i think he only played 11 or 12 snaps but you know the rest of that defense ivan pace is coming back uh harrison phillips is still having a hell of a year and you got bernard and van ginkle and pat jones and all all these guys we're we're, yeah. we're up to Kamu grugier hill and jihad ward having quite possibly the best seasons of their careers in this defense and the front seven has been a godsend because we thought the secondary was going to be a little, well, no, we thought the secondary was going to be solid and the front seven was going to be a little right. iffy going into the season, but they've held up their end of the bargain and then some. So got to, got to go with the Vikings on this one as well. You know, we say front seven, but Chris, you rattled off what 11, 12, maybe 13 guys that have been significant contributors to the Vikings so far. We haven't even mentioned Jerry Tillery, former first round pick that was, kind of considered a bust with the Chargers and the Raiders. And and he's having kind of a rejuvenated year. You mentioned or Phillips. Bullard. Or Jonathan Bullard, who's having, a, who's having a good year. Raging Bullard? You stole my joke with uh, um, Hassan Reddick. A guy, the best player on the Jets' defensive side of the ball, Hassan Reddick, would rather pay more in fines than his salary than play football for the New York Jets right now. But, like, if he does not come in and play, He's going to pay more in fines than his salary than he will make in salary this year. That's insane. Why did he go there from Carolina? Why did he go to the Jets? Well, he got he traded. Got no, he's oh, he yeah, did. He with the Cardinals. He got traded. Oh. And, then, and, then he, and then he said, I want a new deal, and I'm not coming in until I get one. And with the CBA the way it is now, that he really doesn't have any leverage other than to sit out. And he's really cutting off his nose to spite his face, but be that as it may. Frickin' Jets, dude. But, yeah, I mean – Barring the bus getting lost in traffic on the way to the stadium, I don't see how the Jets are going to be able to stop the Vikings defensive front seven from doing pretty much whatever they want to do for most of the afternoon. I'm sure they're going to be able to counter some things, but but I'm I'm glad I'm not Nathaniel Hackett trying to game plan for this front 
Oh. For this defense. Who's the but GM? Because is it GM Weeb Eubank? Because if, if it is, then Weeb Eubank needs to get on the phone, Ted, and call Gastineau and Joe Klecko and some of those guys. That's what he <laughs> needed <laughs> Joe Klecko this week. Joe Klecko. General manager Joe Douglas. That's right. Let's see. We all talked about the front seven now, right? We did. Yeah. All right. Secondary. I'm going to give the check mark to the Jets here. We talked about the garbage time yardage, and I understand that the Vikings are playing with the lead, so they're kind of calling off the dogs. Brian Flores is. I understand that. But they are 32nd in the NFL in passing yardage. The Vikings' defensive secondary is much better than it was last year. I understand that. But the Jets' defensive secondary is pretty good. They're only giving up 128 yards a game. That's pretty good. I mean, Sauce Gardner's a really good defensive back, cornerback. Uh, I think Michael Carter is pretty good. If the Vikings can't establish a running game, I think they will. The way Kevin O'Connell has been calling a game this year, they're going to be able to keep the Jets' defense off balance. But I still give the edge to the Jets' secondary here. Yeah, I kind of tend to agree. Like you said, they might have the best individual player in this matchup in the Sauce Gardner. And we talked about the Vikings giving up a bunch of yardage. It's because they've been playing with a lead. Uh, pretty much all season long, like literally they've only trailed for a few minutes, haven't trailed since the first quarter of the season opener. But, you know, you give up that many yards, I mean, eventually, you know, somebody's going to accomplish something against this secondary. I don't know who it's going to be or when, but the Jets are pretty solid in the secondary. I know they played Bo Nix last week, and Bo Nix is terrible, whether anyone wants to to say he's developing or whatever the case may be, but it's the slightest of edges, but I am going to go with the Jets. Guys, come on. They're always after me lucky charms. No. <laughs> Last week, right. I talked about the 204-yard rushing average of the Packers that the Packers had a game. Mm -hmm. I said it was fool's gold. That's what I said. The Jets' secondary is the same thing. After I researched it, player to player, team to team, O-line to O-line, it's fool's gold. When you look at the quarterback situation, how many interceptions do the Jets have this year? I'm going to help you. They have one. Vikings have eight. Secondary matters. Sure, they've only given up two passing touchdowns all season, but here's the quarterbacks they've faced. You grade them for me. I'll yell out the name. Brock Purdy. Purdy's a good quarterback. A. A, a, a minus B. Purdy, Brock Purdy, A, a B, B plus ish, A minus B plus quarterback. Yeah, he's a good quarterback. All right, he's a C. Will Levis. Okay, he's an F. F minus. Yeah. Jacoby Brissett. Yeah, C. C minus. C minus to D. I mean, he's, he's a, a D. He's a D minus, no higher. Bo Nix. Uh, F. He's, he's an F at this point. So you had two F between those four guys, Purdy, Levis, Brissett, and Nix. You guys had two Fs in there. It's fool's gold. They're walking into a huge buzzsaw. They've never seen this kind. We do this one game at a time, team versus okay. team. They don't know what they're going to do. They, they're going to be freaking out when they find out what Darnold brings with KOC, the way they got the, the Vikings are gelling as an offense. They got a world of crap on their hands. They got to worry about Jones out of the backfield, Chandler out of the backfield. The only spot they really have an advantage for, not worried about the tight end. They got all these wide receivers coming at them. The Vikings get the check mark for the secondary, as far as I'm concerned. They got a much easier job. They got a blanket, Garrett Wilson, and then let try to let Al Toon beat them or whoever they got on the other side. Who do they got? Al Toon. <laughs> Who do they got? Who does that want? Wesley Walker, Ted. They haven't faced an offense like the Vikings, man. They haven't. And they're going to okay. get worked on Sunday. That's just my take on it. I hope you're right. Johnny Lamb Jones is now checking into the game for the New York Jets. <laughs> it was like four brothers, Lamb Jones and Ham Jones. Lamb Jones, Johnny Ham Jones. Jam Jones. Jam Jones. <laughs> was it really? Yeah. I just remember Ham Jones and Lamb Jones. All right, Chris, tell us about the red zone. I mean, the Vikings have been solid in the red zone all year. I think they're ninth in the league offensively and 12th uh, defensively uh, from what the notes say here. Kevin O'Connell's play calling in the red zone has once again been pretty good. Yeah. Uh, Brian Flores, that defense has uh, has not allowed a lot down in the red zone. I mean, I know the Packers had two red zone touchdowns last week. I mean, one drive they had to go three yards, and the other drive they had to go 20 yards. But uh, so the, I don't know how much those really count, but 
again, you look at personnel, the Vikings have a clear advantage on both sides here. I don't know how much more succinctly I can put it than that. So, yeah, check mark uh, Minnesota. Drew, everything Chris just said, exactly right. The Vikings have advantages all the way across the board, especially in the red zone. I don't know what the Jets are going to do if they do get in the red zone. Let's just remember, Houston only got in the red zone twice. That's Houston with Stroud and Collins and Diggs. Twice they got in the red zone. So I don't even know if the Jets are going to sniff it. And if they sniff it, you got to be careful because if it smells like cologne, you better leave it alone. <laughs> all right. Zip. Look, all ladies I'm... and gentlemen of the jury, exhibit A. Number two, would you please back Look, me up? Look, I'm Zippy Longstockings. Ugh, I can't. When a problem comes along, you must zip it. Zip it good. Now, I'll tell you what, the Vikings would be higher than ninth offensively if that fourth down, fourth and goal from the one and a half, if the ball had been spotted correctly, I think that was first down. I think the ball, that was a bad spot. Anyways, that's neither here nor there. It didn't matter at the end. Yeah, Vikings get the check for the red zone for me as well. Everything you guys just said. Special teams, Drew. Special teams. This was a close one for me, but I still gave it to the Vikings. And now I think we could say, Naylor, I didn't even see her. I didn't even know her. I didn't even see her. (laughs) Yeah, we, we we don't need that dude on punt returns anymore. You look at the kicking and the coverage the coverage teams, Vikings have a clear advantage on that. They're both pretty yep. equal on special teams, but like you call them, Will the Thrill, he's perfect on his kicks this year, 12 for 12. Six field goals, six extra points, done. Identical. So Vikings get my special teams helmet this week, and they get my check mark. both. Same here. Chris? Yeah, I mean, uh, Reichert's been great. Uh, you know, Greg Zerline had – Three field goals last week. If he would have had four, the Jets would have won. But he uh, <laughs> he pushed the game winner uh, with time running out. So we don't miss field goals in Minnesota anymore, apparently. So will uh, will the thrill gets uh, gets the check mark? And thank you for knocking on wood for me, Drew. I uh, I appreciate that. No problem. All right, coaching. Right now, four weeks into the season. Now, Andy Andy Reid, probably the best head coach in the NFL. He's got he's got the resume. He's got the He's got the Super Bowl trophies. He's got Mahomes. And he's got Patrick Mahomes. I think it's difficult to find a better offensive-defensive coach combination than Kevin O'Connell and Brian Flores right now. They seem to be in sync and in tune with what each other is thinking. The Vikings are playing exceptionally well on both sides of the football. And then you compare that with Robert Salah and Nathaniel Hackett. I would argue Salah's probably on the hot seat right now or at least it's warm. Nathaniel Hackett was uh, a very highly respected offensive coordinator when, when he was in Green Bay, went to Denver, and like his reputation got completely ruined in about four games with Russell Wilson. I mean, he just went in the tank. And then Rodgers' politic for him to become the offensive coordinator in New York. I mean, this franchise has done more to accommodate one player than I can remember, and it just has not worked out. And the Jets' offense looks discombobulated, out of sync, and Vikings. Now, I went into work on Monday after uh, after the weekend of football, and I, I couldn't hear what was on one of the TVs at work. It had ESPN on, but uh, one of the captions I remember seeing on uh, on the bottom of one of the, uh, the Chirons or whatever said that Rodgers is basically done with Robert Salah. When your quarterback isn't on the same page as you are, that's generally a pretty bad thing particularly if you are, because if I recall correctly, Saleh is a, uh, or Sala, uh, Sala V, whatever, not going to be coaching there much longer anyway, so it doesn't no, matter. No. So, uh, so yeah, if, if you're, he's a defensive guy. So, he is, yes. Uh, so yeah, he, if, if he's not on the same sheet as his quarterback and the guy who is on the same sheet as his quarterback is Nathaniel Hackett, that's probably not great either. And I said it last week and I'll say it again and I'll keep saying it until the wheels come off. Kevin O'Connell is your NFL coach of the year right now. And I don't know if anyone's even running a close second. I will give the Vikings the check mark. So, Drew, a defensive coach and his high paid quarterback not getting along. Have you heard that before? <laughs> I've not heard that before. No. That's just weird. 
Hmm, this is where, so weird. Where did, where did, oh. That would never happen in Minnesota. No. We're one month into the season, Chris, and there's all this dissension. And it, already there's a big problem in New York. After researching them today and yesterday, I did a little yesterday, they are uh, right on the verge of falling to pieces again and starting over. I mean, is there a team that started over more than the Jets? I mean, it's just really the Browns maybe, but specifically talking about coaching, Ted, we've been doing this show, what, three or four years? Mm -hmm. This was my most lopsided choice I've ever had in any category since we started Vikings Report. Really? This is so, yeah, this is so lopsided to the Vikings. Say la vie, Jeff Ulbrich against Brian Flores. That's just not even fair. The Vikings got a huge, huge advantage. And I'll say it like I say it every week. I owe Kevin O'Connell for all that ripping on his play calling. I was wrong. So far, I've been wrong. He has shown me the light. And I've built up a lot of respect for him so far over the first month of the season because he's being creative. He's not being predictable. He's passing the ball after we get a first down in the red zone. I mean, come on. And, and uh, he wasn't doing that last year. So I'll say it. And I'll be glad to raise my hand and say I was wrong about the guy. But uh, this is so lopsided that I yeah, don't I know. know. I don't, you know, Hackett is a respectable guy. And you got to look at Hackett. Look what he's got. He's got a quarterback who's like three years younger than Jesus himself. First off, his running backs are haven't done anything. They got Garrett Wilson, and they got what does Chris say? What does Chris say? The mummified husk of Mercedes Lewis, but they got the mummified husk of Cal the fossilized husk of Mercedes Lewis. The fossil <laughs> now it's the fossilized husk of, of Lazard. Yep. What do you expect them to do with that? You got a terrible yeah. offensive line. What is Hackett supposed to do? But this is really lopsided towards the Vikings. The Vikings just seem like they are going one direction and. The Jets are fighting amongst themselves. Your your cadence sucks. Well, you know what? You're going to get fired. It's it's a mess. Vikings. Vikings. Check mark. All right. Intangibles. As always, it is a standard PPR scoring format. Every week, this year, Drew, Chris, Ruby, and I will pick one quarterback, one running back, two wide receivers, and one tight end. Every week, you will pick the team you think has the best chance of winning. Put your entry in the comments below here. Don't hit us up on our Facebook page. Don't hit us up on X or Twitter or whatever Elon Musk is calling it. Every time we pick a player, we can only pick that player one time throughout the course of the season. So it's done. So if we don't pick a player and that player gets hurt for the season, too bad for us. We can't use it. We don't know the picks beforehand, but we send picks in. And we don't pick the players that are playing on the Thursday night game because that might have one team that you folks might pick sort of unfair advantage in case they go off and get like 40 or 50 points, whatever the case may be. The big change to this year, in years past, we've given you three points for first place, two points for second place, one point for third. This year, you get all the points that you would get in a standard PPR format week if you play fantasy football. So, for example, if you pick my team and I score 75 points in one week, and then you pick Chris's team and they score 75 points in week two, you have 150 points throughout two weeks. And that keeps going throughout the season. Conversely, if you pick, like, Drew's team and they only score 10 points, and then Ruby's team and they score, like, 300 points, then you have 310 points. It gives you a chance to catch up if you kind of fall behind. Whereas, in past seasons, if you weren't doing so well, it was kind of hard to catch up. So this year, you can kind of fall back in the back pretty fast. So, standard PPR scoring format all season, and you have points throughout the year. You can find a little bit throughout the season on Viking We'll keep that updated for us. And we've got a really awesome prize for our grand prize winner this year. It is a Justin Jefferson jersey. Put it up on the board for our championship. Second place is a nice to find Diggs Vikings jersey as well. Do I make you horny, baby? Do I make you randy?